Hello, and welcome to Scribes and Songsters. I'm Veronique Mandel. Our guest today is Bob Lynch, a well-known resident and big booster of Kingsville. Bob taught school in Kingsville for 35 years, coached many teams, is a local historian, and is very active in, in local affairs, including serving a term as president of the Art Society of Kingsville. Bob has written a number of books, including some about the history of Kingsville. His first book, Taking the Lectic, is about the electric streetcar that ran from Windsor through Kingsville to Leamington a hundred years ago. He's also written about the Grovedale House, a former historic Kingsville tavern that became a haven for rum runners during the Prohibition era. And as interesting as all that sounds, today we're going to discuss his latest book, Surfside 3, which tells the story of when the Kingsville Pavilion at Lakeside Park was a musical hotspot during the 1960s. Welcome to Scribes and Songsters. Well, thanks for asking me. You've written some really neat stuff. I have, and I've enjoyed every bit of it. Yeah, I bet you have. And uh, some of it uh, is a lot of research. Yes, it is. It's things that haven't been done as a history, mm -hmm. and I think they need to be done, like this one. Speaking of this one, I was fascinated because I'm not from Kingsville, but I've been to Lakeside uh, park, mm -hmm. and I went to a wedding there. I had no idea that it had such an incredible history. And, of course, it's all about dancing. Yes. And uh, you write about why we dance. Why is dancing important to us? I think that it's certainly music is in our souls. And when the band is playing or the record is on, we start to move molecules in our body want to go and i just think it's good and then when you're with someone that you're comfortable with you have a good time and, and that's what you want and it's an excuse to get closer <laughs> well it is yes absolutely and in many times especially back pre-50 you know people frowned on you if you were kind of touching just about yeah but dancing would be okay so that's, that's a way for people to find a chance to get a little romantic um, episode going. <laughs> so tell me how you sort of got started. We'll come back to this because there's so many amazing stories from that place. Yes. But how did you get started with all of this? Were you always a writer? Um, well, certainly at university, I had enough papers to write. Yeah. But, <laughs> but as, a, as a teacher, I was reading more than I was writing. But I had time after I retired, and there were some things that I wanted to do, especially the electric, because it was nobody even knew about it. I didn't know the tracks ran down the middle of the road, you know, and things like that. Um, so I just felt there were some histories that needed to be told. And then I had a chance to spread some fiction, you know, in my other books. So what do you prefer? Fiction or not? It's hard. Um, it's almost a toss-up. Yeah. Uh, certainly the fiction uh, is easier because you can say what you basically I want know, to say. I know. You can make anything as, up. Yeah, as long as it's flowing. But you still have to research it. Um, in the book I did before this, Sarah and the Traveling Mason Jar, uh, there was a young man. I had a young man in a wheelchair. And... I was looking for a sport for him to play. And I felt that wheelchair basketball, well, I'm a basketball coach, but I felt that wheelchair basketball for him was too mild. I came across wheelchair rugby. So in that searching, that research I was doing, I came upon a perfect one for him because that is a really rough sport mm -hmm. for people in a wheelchair. Yeah, no kidding. They think they shouldn't be, they're rough. <laughs> they throw people down, teammates grab them and bring them back up again. Yeah. You know? So you have to research even in a fiction, mm -hmm. but it's not the deep research that you have to do for something mm -hmm. else. Uh, before I ask you about the research um, uh, for this current book, Surfside 3, um, wh where did that title come from? Surfside? No, the previous one, um, The Traveling... Oh, um, Traveling Mason? Yeah. 
Well, I have, I, the book's about a Métis teen, sub-teen, um, who lives at the northern shores of Lake Huron with no social media, no internet. She has a landline and a mailbox. And that's it. And no friends, basically. The the indigenous community, because she lives with her white father, the indigenous community kind of shunned her. Mm -hmm. Her cousins shunned her. And so she was searching for people to know. And she sent a mason jar down the lake with note in it. And the idea is that the finders, random finders, um, write back to her. And they, become, they come in contact. And then they, some of the random finders, with reading notes later down the lakes, you now have a whole conglomeration of notes in that bottle. So they're reading all the other notes. So they're kind of picking up information from other random people. So that's the whole idea, was a randomness. What a great premise for a movie. It was. <laughs> <laughs> it's a Hallmark kind of thing, isn't it? Well, I copied it from original book later, later, I mean, way back in time, um, called Paddle to the Sea. I used that kind of a backup, and I think that I didn't steal from them. I had my own ideas, mm -hmm. but um, I just thought uh, the whole idea of something traveling randomly and meeting random people mm -hmm. was what I was after. So let's get back to Surfside 3. Um, what interested you in it? Um, you know, did you know about it? Or? Oh, I knew about it, definitely. Yeah. Um, I started teaching here in 63. I was just barely 20 years old by a few days. So by 65, I was only 22. The last place I was going to be was around where a bunch of teenagers were. Right. As a teacher especially. I wasn't going to put myself in that position. So So this was a teen hangout. It was a teen thing. Yeah. Absolute teens. And they didn't even check, you know, ages or anything. Um, I Some stories come up as 12-year-olds or 11-year-olds that got in. Mm -hmm. um, it was just a special time and a special place. Really, the biggest thing was it was unique. There were lots of dances around. I mean, in the 50s, I attended dances at Riverside Arena. Mm -hmm. uh, that's where I grew up in Riverside. Um, and there were dances in Leamington, two of them at the arena in Leamington and at Casper's, which is a roller skating rink down by Point Pelee. Yeah. Um, every other town pretty well had a dance. What made this unique? This one was unique, I think, because of Rick. Rick was a cop from Harrow. He was black. He was six foot eight and weighed probably three to 400 pounds, someplace in there. And so he was what Ned Cossum, one of the owners, said to me, we needed a, prem a presence. Uh, we needed something special. And he was it. So he kept the dance fair. No fighting. Other dances had fighting. Yeah. There was no fighting at all at this one because Rick wouldn't allow it. He was there all the time. And then Robin Dobson, the local police officer, helped him out. But um, that was one of the things. There were four of them that I thought about, and I think I, I kind of come across them in the, in the book. One of them was the American Teens. Almost the whole way from Kingsville... First off, Kingsville doesn't have any beaches to the east. Mm -hmm. That's cliffs. Right. Not big cliffs, but cliffs. And, and water right up to the cliff. So the west from Kingsville, all wonderful beaches, all the way to Amherstburg, mm -hmm. pretty well. There's some in Colchester that have yep. some rough spots. But uh, for the most part, there are beaches and cottages. It was the middle-class Americans who had money were here. The kids had cars or had access to cars. Our Kingsville teens didn't have access to cars in the early 60s. They really didn't. Yeah. One or two might have, but not very many. So 
that combination of being able to cross paths was one of the special things. The other one was the Kingsville rented out the property. And beside the pavilion was what was called the bathhouse. It was a two-story building with uh, a snack bar on the upper floor and accommodations. The lower floor was uh, change rooms for, from, for the people who were at the, at the beaches. And they had a lot of them. Well, yeah, they had a lot of space there. It was, big, it was a good big-sized building. Hmm. Now, the Cossums had their restaurant burned out in, where they lived above it in Bell River, so they were desperate for a place to live. Uh, he and uh, Ned and, and Gunther were friends. So, and, and when Gunther said, well, but Kingsville, and the one of the counselors was also a realtor, and he was trying to talk Mr. Cossum into taking this for $600 a year, what, the I mean, rental. Was that a lot of money at the time? Um not really when you consider a car was three thousand mm. dollars or close to four. So you know six hundred dollars <laughs> for a year wasn't an enormous thing at all. Um, and Ned heard about this and he got a hold of his dad and said, "Get it, I'll pay for it." They paid for it in the first yeah. night. I mean, you know <laughs> was that was that big a deal? Um, the other one was their connection with CKLW, the big eight. That was the biggest connection. So who did they have the, the relationship with there? It started out with uh, Dave Schaefer and maybe maybe uh, uh, Joe Van. But it was, um, and here I'm coming up with a block right now, um, Shannon. Tom Shannon. Yes. It was Tom Me, Shannon Me. who was the big one. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I've often, I thought after the, I had the book written, I wish I had thought of it during writing, I'd have put it in. I wonder if people down in Kentucky, mm-hmm. New Orleans, out towards Denver, because CKLW broadcast that far. Because it was 50,000 hertz, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah. 80,000. 80, wow. That's because it was the big eight. Right. That's where it came from. Right. Um, I wonder if one of those teens from those areas, listening to Tom Shannon on CKLW, listening to the hits, when he said, I'll see you in, at the pavilion in Kingsville, they were probably wondering, where in the heck is yeah. Kingsville? I want to go, you know. Yeah. So it really spread the word. And having CKLW, because it was such a hit maker, um, when you think about the small town radio stations, promoters had to go to each one of those stations and ask them to play a certain record. Mm-hmm. Well, the only a very small portion of the population would hear that record. Whereas when Tom Shannon played it to several million teens, they all heard it at the same time. Yeah. And... I think that that's why rock and roll really came alive. There were some small stations, but CKLW was the big one. And they had Rosalie Tremblay. Well, Rosalie Tremblay came in later, okay? And she was a spectacular one. Yeah. Um, she had such a, a, a feel for music. You know, when, when I put in the book, and this is the, the rumor that was running around, and I a lot of that book is rumor or close to touching the truth because it's it's someone's memory right okay because from what i understand there there's not a lot written down nothing was written nothing nothing was nothing was left they will take simply take let's say cklw when cbc took over they came in with dumpsters and they just took file cabinets full of full of notes and things and dumped them out i talked to one gentleman who said i got i ran down the hallway into my office and opened my file cabinet and grabbed a bunch of stuff. And they said, throw it back in. And he said, I said, no, I'm not going to. Wow. Because he wanted to keep that Mm -hmm. memorabilia going. So there wasn't anything left. When they were through, 
C, the old CKLW no yeah. longer existed. And that same thing happened with Gunther Funkenhauser. He had all his records. He was a manager of an I, IGA yeah. and in Kingsville here. So they, they went into his office after the, the mother ship <laughs> um, decided that was going, they were going to close that branch. Um, went into his office and just cleaned it out one weekend. He didn't know they were cleaning it. So he didn't have anything. So he never kept anything at home. Mm-hmm. So how did you find out, get, find people who could remember stuff? Well, I was fortunate enough, the newspaper, the, the South Point Sun, mm-hmm. put it in a couple of times. And uh, I just talked to everybody I could talk to and say, tell me your stories. And some people were more than eager to tell me their stories. Yeah. Other people said, oh, it's not funny. It's not this. It's not that. And I never got their stories. And, of course, memories get dim yes. after a while, don't they? But people certainly remember it and loved it. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, so much so that a couple of years later, after it closed, a group of people in town decided to have a reunion. And the reunion lasted three times longer than the actual Surfside 3. That's astounding. Yeah. Now, they were raising money for cause. Yeah. You know, but still, they were there dancing in their pavilion yeah. to live bands. Another thing that absolutely blew me away. Now, I mean, I come from a little town in Newfoundland. And when I was a teenager, we didn't have big names coming to our little town to do teenage dances but tell us about the roster of entertainers. Well, that's the fourth thing, the unique thing. Because of Tom Shannon and Joe Van and, and Dave Schaefer, they were able to bring across big names that wanted to be on stage, but they weren't big names yet. Um, I'll give you an example. Tony, Orlando, and Don. All right? Don, two Two friends, 14 years old, you know, wanted, all they wanted to do was sing. So they came more than once, several times actually. Um, I think apparently a parent brought them. And they were on stage and the people loved them. And they weren't getting paid. They weren't, they weren't getting paid. No, no, it's all free. <laughs> um, all the, the acts that were there weren't being paid. They were just trying to promote a song, a new record, um, or just, they were so young, they just wanted stage time because it takes, to be really good on stage, it takes time and practice and all of those things. Tell us about some other people. Well, we can go down the list of, of anybody out of Motown, uh, Michael Jackson. Now, Michael Jackson was basically nine years old when he was there first. Yeah. So his brothers were the ones that were brought in, and they were called at that time the Jacksons. F- no, not, oh, not number. five. No, no, no. Oh, just, just the, the Jacksons. Jacksons. There were oh, four wow. of them. Four yeah. roughly close to age boys. Mm-hmm. Um, and they were doing a lot of doo-wop stuff and things like that. Uh, basically out of the late 50s, early 60s kind of music. Uh, Michael was with them because they, his father couldn't leave him home. Right? <laughs> so, so he, the stories were, he jumped up on stage, nobody stopped him, and he just danced. And I put the line in there, I wonder if he worked out the moonwalk while he was in Kingsville. Yeah. But because he was just trying things. And 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 he probably did a good job and they loved him. Now yeah. by the time he was twelve or so, then he became the Jack they was became the Jackson five because he was now singing. Right. And dancing as well. And the the, the brothers, one being headliners, were now backing the, the youngest the brother, you know, um, the Supremes. Imagine. Mar- you know, <laughs> the, the Vandellas. Yeah, um, Martha Reeves. Martha yeah. Reeves, the Vandellas. Yeah, um, I just... Stevie I just, Wonder. Stevie Wonder was there. He was yeah. 13, too. And he sang and sang, and he was back many, many times. They He liked it there because everybody loved him, mm-hmm. you know? And I don't know what the, the deal is, but it was just that Detroit was close. It's only 30 miles or so. Yeah. The border at that time was pretty open, but non-existent. Was, wide, was wide open pretty yeah. well. So they had no difficulty running back and forth. Mm-hmm. And 
music was big. Everybody wanted music, and yeah. they were all there. Now you had like the Commodores with Lionel Richie, but Lionel Richie was just the head singer then. He wasn't important mm -hmm. until after yeah. he left the Commodores. So all of these people were just working their cra their craft, and we got the benefit of it. Yeah. And it was live music all the time. They, I said, did you play records? He said, no. We just had live music every night. That's really something. Yeah. Um, and, of course, what about, uh, speaking of live music, what about the local bands? Because there were quite a few every night, weren't there? Yeah, absolutely. And many of them came out of, uh, yeah, they were high school students. Uh, one young man came to me and he said, uh, we were, I was in grade nine, grade, we had two grade tens and, and a grade 12. <laughs> and we put the band together, we were called the Five. But that's a phonetic movement, P-5. <laughs> um, he said, and we played for two years. Yeah. And at high school dances, especially out at Surfside, because Surfside was wonderful for us. Um, I thought it, it was interesting as well, uh, because, you know, you, you forget that there were songs that were dances. Absolutely. And, and, and record, um, the, the singers and the record producers would put out a song, make one up, to fit the dance craze of the time. But when you take, like, Chubby Checker and the Twist, yeah. that was one, you know, and then you had the Pony, and then you had several others. Uh, when that song came on, everybody did that. Today... At a, at, at a dance where there are a lot of older people, such as myself, when somebody puts on a certain kind of song, your people just fall into place, like the stroll. You know, it's, a, it's an easy one. People yeah. just line up and everybody does a stroll, and it's really kind of neat to see. So there was that a kind of a thing. We don't see that today. You no. see people on a dance floor a day just wiggling. Yeah. Moving her hands, moving her whatever. But I think, and I watch them, and I'm thinking, where is the musical timing? I can't see you finding the melody in this. And I, and I go, how do you know what you're listening to? Yeah. I think you're just trying to move, which I guess is not bad, yeah. but <laughs> it doesn't fit with what I understand is music and dance. And a lot of the young Americans did the hand jive. Well, yeah, absolutely. That, yeah. Was, that was one. Everybody did that. Yeah, everybody. Yeah, pretty yeah. well. Now, there were some localized movements. Um, the chicken. Not the chicken dance for... For, <laughs> for the weddings. Wedding <laughs> dance. No, no. It was called the chicken. And that was localized to Detroit, Windsor. Oh, really? Basically, yeah. They didn't do that in Los Angeles or anywhere yeah. else or New York. Yeah. Um, we had some of those little unique features, too. This is... It was such a wonderful re book to research and, and do. Mm -hmm. And uh, did you get any recounting of, did they, uh, you know, have issues with alcohol or drugs? Um, it, drugs were not really a prominent thing no. here in the 60s and, and early 70s, with 72. Um, alcohol, certainly. Beer. Yeah. Uh, but it was not inside. Rick wouldn't hmm. allow it inside. Yeah. And down, down by the water, certainly. Down yeah. by the bridge, yes. Uh, parking lot in your mm -hmm. cars, right? There was something. It's wherever teens are going to be, alcohol <laughs> is going to be present. Yeah, I hate to say it, but it's true. We used to run dances at the high school. Mm -hmm. They're not running anymore. Oh, really? No, there's no more dances at the high school. So that's unfortunate. It there's, is. There really is no place for teens to gather. And this provided us a wonderful place for mm -hmm. teens to gather. And, and I, when I asked people about I wanted, when I wanted stories, they would say, oh, I had a great time, but I don't really remember anything, you know. I just was, wow, it was wonderful. Yeah. What would it take, or could you today have something like Surfside 3? No. No. Couldn't do it. Uh, and I, I don't like to be a naysayer. Really, I don't. Mm -hmm. Do you think parents, 
you know, have a role to play in in what's happened? Do you think parents should be more supportive of having a place f- for kids? I'm going to get hated for this one. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just trying to be as truthful as possible. Absolutely. I think most parents don't give a darn. They're too busy with their own lives. Um, they don't want to go out. Now, there's certainly some. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. there we have a number of youth sports, and we have a ton of parents that are supporting those and coaching and helping out. But dances is not something they want to go to because there could be difficulties where they would have to step in and they don't wish to do that. Well, again, that's because they don't wish to be sued. Right. So as long as the courts run, we have problems. I hate to say it, but it's true. Mm-hmm. It's really unfortunate, isn't it? Oh, it's terribly unfortunate because they're losing out. Yes. And I feel so sorry for them because there's so many kids who have such a wonderful time. I know. So what's next for Bob Lynch? Are well, you writing? Are you working on another book? Well, I started to do the music in this area. Yeah? It's too big. It's too mm-hmm. large. It is huge. Um, even the even the history the, from pre nineteen hundred is is huge. When you get things like the old Metawas Hotel, uh, a major writer in Detroit wrote a song called the Me- the Metawas Dance, and it was quite popular f- with people who attended the Metawas dances. So I I decided I had to break it down, and this is the first. Yeah, uh, I'm going to take a look at the high school bands and the the elementary school bands and talk about them for a while. I know at least they'll have some pictures. That'll be terrific. Well, you'll have to let us know uh, when you get one of those finished. I definitely will. Thank you so much. This was so interesting, and it's just tremendous, uh, you know, for people like me who who, uh, are not from here, uh, and I'm sure for all the people in Kingsville to sort of get a a look back. Thank you so much. You're more than welcome. Well, that's all for this edition of Scribes and Songsters. Thanks to our great guest, Bob Lynch. Thanks to our Scribes and Songsters team, producer Brian Sweet and technical producer and editor Gary Glass. Grateful thanks to Tony Toldo and the Toldo Foundation and to Neil and Tina Queering for their support. Thank you for watching. Hope to see you soon right back here on Scribes and Songsters. I'm Veronique Mandel. Bye for now.